As the men sat in the stifling summer heat, debating the merits of the proposed constitution, an imposing six-foot-tall man rose from his chair and prepared to speak once more. As he begins to speak, some of his fellow delegates sit attentively, others barely conceal their contempt. By the time the convention would end, he would give 173 speeches, the most of any delegate. He'd also take a key role in drafting the final document. He wrote the preamble and was one of the few delegates that championed the abolition of slavery. But he didn't support equality. Born from a wealthy family, he distrusted the uneducated masses, believing that their role in government needed to be limited, lest the country collapse into mob rule. Give the votes to people who have no property, he said, and they will sell them to the rich who will be able to buy them. He called for the president to be appointed for life, and for senators to be appointed directly by the president. He viewed the Western settlers as savages. Today, we will explore the fascinating life of Governor Morris, an American statesman, diplomat, financer, and ultimately the penman of the Constitution. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Governor Morris was born on January 31st, 1752, into one of the wealthiest and most prestigious families in New York, with a long tradition of government service. His father, Lewis Morris Jr., was a longtime member of the New York General Assembly, and his mother, Sarah Governor, was descended from an influential Dutch family from the early days of New Amsterdam. As Lewis and Sarah's only child, Governor took on his mother's surname. Morris was born on his family's massive estate, Morrisania. His education defined his early childhood. He was taught by the best tutors his family's deep pockets could find. By the age of 12, the young Morris was attending King's College in New York. He graduated in 1768. Unlike many of his contemporaries, he immediately returned to college, obtaining a master's degree in 1771. During his commencement address, he made little effort to hide his Enlightenment sympathies, stating that love of country for a British subject is based on the solid foundation of liberty. After obtaining his degree, Governor clerked for William Smith, one of the most prominent attorneys in New York City. Though Smith would later become a loyalist, while Governor was his apprentice, he was a heartfelt patriot. Through Smith, Governor would be introduced to fellow patriots John Jay and Alexander Hamilton. After finishing his apprenticeship in 1775, Governor was admitted to the state bar and began practicing law. Only a few months after he founded his own practice, he was appointed to represent his family's estate in the New York Provincial Congress. As the Provincial Congress began drifting towards independence from Great Britain, Governor was forced to make a difficult choice. His mentor turned father figure, William Smith, balked at declaring independence from Great Britain and became a loyalist. The Morris family itself also gravitated towards the British, while one of his half-brothers, Lewis Morris, would sign the Declaration of Independence, another one, Stats Long Morris, would become a British Major General. After New York City fell to the British in August 1776, his mother, Sarah, donated Morrisania to the British, who used it as a military post throughout the war. In the end, however, Governor's Enlightenment ideals outweighed his familial ties, and he cast his lot with the Patriots, writing, In every society, the members have a right to the utmost liberty that can be enjoyed consistent with the general safety. To Morris, that very liberty was under threat. After making his decision, Morris threw himself into his work. He played a crucial role in helping New York become an independent state. 
who played a prominent part in drafting the New York Constitution of 1777. Morris continued surprising his peers. After they discovered his knack for managing money, he was quickly appointed chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, the legislative body responsible for allocating military funding. The intelligent, charismatic, and hard-working young man would quickly gain further power, playing a central role on the New York Committee of Safety. One of his main tasks was to monitor and detain loyalists. He also tried to coordinate efforts between the New York State Militia and the Continental Army with mixed results. Despite his efforts, he could not run for the Provincial Assembly after the fall of New York City as he was no longer a landed man. Refusing an undemocratic appointment to the Provincial Assembly, he was instead selected to serve as one of New York's delegates to the Continental Congress. He assumed his seat on January 28, 1778, at the age of just 25. One of his first official duties as a member of the Continental Congress was to accompany a delegation of congressmen to Valley Forge, where he reported on the state of the Continental Army. Morris was appalled by the conditions of the camp. When he and the delegation arrived, they were greeted by an army of skeletons, naked, starved, sick, and discouraged. As soon as he returned to Congress, Morris became the Continental Army's principal spokesman, working tirelessly to equip the men not only with proper clothing and weapons, but also food, medical supplies, and adequate lodging. Without his consistent advocacy, it's anyone's guess whether the army would have or could have survived the harsh winter. This isn't to say Governor was popular among his fellow delegates. He was not. He was the youngest delegate at just 25 years old. He was not only loud and outspoken, but also had a brash, crass sense of humor. His frankness and lack of subtlety set him apart from the other older delegates. It was also well known that he often indulged in the pleasures of the ladies of Philadelphia. All of this combined made him arguably one of the least popular delegates at the Second Continental Congress. The major accomplishment of his brief term in Congress came when he signed the Articles of Confederation, despite having reservations about its ability to protect the rights of its citizens. He was a passionate advocate for a stronger national government, a government that could safeguard the liberty and security of all citizens, openly saying that the Articles were too weak. His loud calls for a strong national government were incredibly unpopular back in New York when it came time for the Provincial Assembly to select their delegates for 1779, his public opposition to the Articles, as well as his frankness, were his undoing. Governor Morris would be a one-term delegate. Governor was shocked when he was not re-elected to another term. His home, occupied by the enemy and feeling snubbed by the Provincial Assembly, he decided to remain in Philadelphia becoming a successful lawyer and merchant. During his self-imposed exile in Philadelphia, Governor was involved in a horrific carriage accident that necessitated the amputation of his left leg below the knee. Losing his leg, however, didn't seem to bother Governor, who continued his career as a merchant. He also continued to enjoy the comforts of the fairer sex. The same year he lost his leg, he published a series of essays on finance in the Pennsylvania Packet. These publications caught the eye of the new superintendent of finance, Robert Morris, who quickly asked Governor to join him as his deputy. Governor, who was unrelated to Robert, quickly agreed, serving faithfully from early 1781 until Robert resigned on November 1st, 1784. While working for Robert Morris, Governor Morris helped him obtain funding for the Continental Army, attempt currency reform, and found the Bank of North America. He also developed the decimalization system that helped pave the way for the U.S. monetary system. After resigning from his post alongside Robert, Governor once again became a successful merchant and lawyer, 
remaining largely aloof from political affairs. It was a great surprise to him when he was chosen as one of Pennsylvania's eight delegates to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. The convention and his profound impact on shaping the document it produced would be his greatest legacy. As the delegates gathered in Philadelphia, most thought they'd finish in just a few weeks, if not days. As far as they were concerned, they were there to revise the Articles of Confederation, not construct a new government entirely. When the convention, though, decided to create a new document, nobody anticipated the level of dominance Governor Morris would have in the discussion. Nonetheless, on a variety of topics, he led the debate and made his views on a multitude of matters clear. His ability to shape the conversation and provide thought-provoking insight helped guide his fellow delegates. For this occasion, he put on his best behavior. The usually rash and outgoing governor was instead quiet and reserved, but still impassioned. He spoke eloquently and at length. Those who knew him from the Second Continental Congress days scarcely believed he was the same man. As we know, Morris was already a firm supporter of a powerful national government dating back to his time in the Second Continental Congress. He quickly aligned himself with George Washington and James Madison, two of the most prominent advocates for a stronger national government. One of his first speeches on May 30th formally proposed the legislature, executive, and judiciary branches as features of the new government. The assembly quickly adopted that proposal. He also spoke at length about the possibility of mob rule and his desire to protect the liberties of all people. During and after the convention, his opponents would chastise him as an aristocrat to the core, believing that there never was, nor ever will be, a civilized society without an aristocracy. While there is some truth to this characterization, he was, after all, a firm supporter of a government led by an aristocratic elite. His reasoning went beyond simple discontent for the downtrodden masses. He was certainly wary of mob rule, but Morris believed that having the House of Representatives open to all freemen while the Senate was reserved for wealthy landowners, would prevent the rich and powerful from completely dominating all levels of government. This isn't to say he was an advocate of equal political power, though. While the House would serve as a check on the Senate, he wanted the presidency as a lifetime position, with the express power to appoint and dismiss senators, with no input at all from the people. Likewise, judges were to be appointed by the president. In July, Morris advised the delegates that no new western states should be allowed to join the Union. He feared the savage lands of the interior would not produce enlightened statesmen. Relative to the western country had not changed his opinion on that head. Among other objections, it must be apparent they would not be able to furnish men equally enlightened to share in the administration of our common interests. The busy haunts of men, not the remote wilderness, was the proper school of political talents. If the Western people get the power into their hands, they will ruin the Atlantic interests. Morris's most famous speech during the convention, however, came on August 8, 1787. In the speech, he eloquently declares his opposition to slavery as well as his reservations about, including the Three-Fifths Compromise. This was a provision that declared every three out of five slaves were to be counted when determining a state's population, thus granting the sparsely populated southern slave states more seats in the House of Representatives in the new Constitution. Morris said, I never would concur in upholding domestic slavery. It was a nefarious institution. It was the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. Compare the free regions of the middle states, where a rich and noble cultivation marks the prosperity and happiness of the people with the misery and poverty which overspread the barren wastes of Virginia, Maryland, and the other states having slaves. Travel through ye whole continent, 
and you behold the prospect continually varying with the appearance and disappearance of slavery. The moment you leave the eastern states and enter New York, the effects of the institution become visible. Passing through the Jerseys and entering Pennsylvania, every criterion of superior improvement witnessing the change. Proceed southwardly, and every step you take through ye great regions of slaves presents a desert increasing with the increasing proportion of these wretched beings. Upon what principle is it that the slaves shall be computed in the representation? Are they men? Then make them citizens. Let them vote. Are they property? Why is no other property then included? The houses in this city are worth more than all the wretched slaves which cover the rice swamps of South Carolina. The admission of slaves into the representation, when fairly explained, comes to this. That the inhabitant of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa, and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity, tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and damns them to the most cruel bondages, shall have more votes in a government instituted for protection and the rights of mankind than the citizens of Pennsylvania or New Jersey who views with a laudable horror so nefarious a practice. His fellow delegates were not moved, and the three-fifths compromise was included in the Constitution at the behest of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. A vote held after his speech voted one, seven to one, against his measure to abolish slavery. He was the only one who voted yes. The speech, however, went a long way to cement the hatred of many influential slaveholders. Due to his lively participation in debates, Governor Morris was elected by his fellow delegates to the Committee of Style and Arrangement. This five-person committee was tasked to prepare the wording of the final document. It was at this time that Morris wrote the infamous preamble to the United States Constitution. The powerful words he wrote have reverberated throughout history. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. When the final document was signed and the convention finally dissolved, everyone, including his rivals, acknowledged Governor Morris wrote most of the final draft. George Washington was no exception. Shortly after he returned to Mount Vernon, he wrote a letter of thanks to Governor for his contributions and guidance during the convention. I have observed that your name to the new Constitution has been of infinite service. Indeed, I am convinced that if you had not attended the convention and the same paper had been handed out to the world, it would have met with a colder reception, with fewer and weaker advocates, and with more and more strenuous opponents. After the Constitutional Convention, Governor decided to retire from public life, traveling to France in 1789 on business. Despite having no interest in public service, Governor was asked to serve as U.S. Minister Plenipotentiary to France. He reluctantly agreed, remaining at his post until 1794. As one author notes, Governor was the only foreign representative who remained in his post throughout the worst days of the terror. He once had to convince a mob that wanted to hang him that he had lost his leg fighting as a soldier in the American Revolution rather than in a horrific carriage accident. His diaries from this turbulent period in France depict the man struggling to come to terms with the violence and chaos of revolutionary France, leaving him increasingly disillusioned and prompting him to re-examine many of the ideals of the American Revolution. He began to question the lofty goals of freedom and liberty and the human cost of achieving them. His time as minister was marked by failure. First, he declined to help free the Marquis de Lafayette's family from prison, 
despite repeated instructions ordering him to do so. He also failed to sufficiently advocate on behalf of Thomas Paine, the author of Common Sense, another prisoner in revolutionary France. After these and other failures, he was removed from office. He continued his career as a businessman in France for a few years, living a life of scandalous luxury in Paris until he returned to the United States in 1798. The first thing he did upon his return was to formally purchase the family estate from his older brother. Although he wanted to retire to Morisania, he was convinced by his friend and longtime political ally, Alexander Hamilton, to run for the U.S. Senate. He agreed and served a single term from May 3, 1800 to March 3, 1803. He lost his half-hearted re-election campaign. Out of office, the 57-year-old bachelor finally decided to get married in 1809 to 35-year-old Anne Carrie Randolph. The couple would have one child, Governor Morris Jr., who would become a railway tycoon. He never seemed able to retire from public life. From 1810 to 1813, he served as chairman of the Erie Canal Commission, laying the groundwork for the first waterway connection between the Atlantic Ocean and the Great Lakes. He helped shape the layout of New York City by helping draft the commissioner's plan of 1811, which formalized the street layout of Manhattan. After a few years of peace away from public life, Governor Morris died from an infection at the family estate on November 6, 1816, at the age of 64. He was buried in the cemetery of St. Anne's Episcopal Church in the Bronx. In some ways, Governor Morris was ahead of his time. At a time when few dared, he spoke openly and at length about the nefarious institution of slavery and tried to get his fellow countrymen to abolish it, even though he must have known his pleas would fall on deaf ears and also harm his reputation. He still fought for the cause of liberty, even as most of his family abandoned him and fought alongside an enemy that would have hung him. But in other ways, he was a relic of a bygone age. He was a man who believed in the superiority of the landed aristocracy and deeply feared the chaos of what he termed mob rule. He feared the uncivilized nature of his fellow man, regardless of their skin color. In the end, it seems only fitting that such a complicated man, defined by his contradictions, wrote the infamous preamble to the oldest and longest standing constitution still in force today. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the dashing Polish cavalryman dubbed the father of the American cavalry, Casimir Pulaski.